uh, nothing to do with those decisions. But um, uh, you saw the reaction. Many people consider that uh, those uh, members of the Catalan government that were sacked, remanded in custody, are now political prisoners. The Catalan opposition, though, is, is not in agreement. We heard Albert Rivera, the leader of the Citizens' Party, saying, uh, what did those people expect? They had disobeyed uh, constitutional court orders not to go ahead with the referendum, not to declare independence uh, unilaterally, and they kept on doing it. At some point, uh, they might be remanded in custody, he said, uh, because they would continue to repeat their crimes. Another win against the IS group. The Syrian army says it freed Deir ez-Zor after weeks of fighting in conjunction with allied forces. It was the last strong. City from the north. The jihadists had been present in the city since early 2015 after they captured large parts of the area and secured oil fields that helped finance their operations. Despite repeated offenses by the Syrian army and airstrikes by its ally Russia, the IS group was at its height, able to control half of the city of Deir Azor, as well as parts of the province. During the city's siege, activists reported dire humanitarian conditions. Civilians faced food shortages and limited access to basic health care. The United Nations, as well as Russia, began dropping aid into the city in 2016, helping the 90,000 remaining inhabitants of Deir Azor. Ground reports suggest much of the city has been devastated by years of fighting and airstrikes. Prior to the war, 300,000 people called Deir Azor home. Sanam Jantier joins us now from the France 24 International Affairs Desk. Thank you so much for joining us on set. Uh, the liberation of Deir Zor from the Islamic State group has been dubbed a, quote, largely symbolic victory. Uh, Sanam, just how significant is this victory? Sure, I spent the entire day talking to various experts who spend their time observing the militants and their presence in the region. And if I really had to put my editorial cap on here, I'd push against this line that this is yet another symbolic victory, that this is the last stronghold, the last bastion of the militants in the region. How many times have we heard that line? Yes, of course, Deir Ezzor has been recaptured. It is significant because of its proximity to the Iraqi border. It's an oil-rich region. But what about the vacuum that is then left behind? Whatever happened to the Iraqi city of Mosul, which was recaptured back in July, which experts are now saying is largely neglected, especially in the West, where hospitals, schools, government institutions are flattened, bodies are still being pulled from beneath the rubble. And then there's, of course, Fallujah, which was liberated a year ago. Residents are still complaining from mismanagement. And then we can't forget the fact that the Islamic State groups still are present in the region. They have pockets. They have one in the city of Bukhama. There are pockets in the northwestern region of Hama, in the southern suburbs of Damascus. So, A, they're present, B, there's little hope that the cities will be livable once they've been captured. And in fact, earlier I spoke to an expert in the region, Peter Harling, and this is what he had to say about the ongoing threat of the militants, uh, not just in the region, but across the board. Well, they've lost territory, which was to a large extent desert and ruins, and the cities they took control of have been thoroughly destroyed in the process of, of fighting against the Islamic State. So now you inherit a territory which is very difficult to rule, uh, where people will have a very hard time to go back to, and, and where virtually no serious planning has been um, made to, to ensure any form of normalization. So that, that's your biggest problem, more than the defeat in itself. And I think the Islamic State has this ability to redeploy or to just mutate into another avatar uh, and strike here and there.
That was an interview with uh, Peter Harling on the full version will be aired this weekend. Now, Shauna, by redeployment and mutation, that analyst is talking about the tentacles of the Islamic State group uh, spreading beyond Iraq and Syria. And of course, earlier this week, we saw that attack carried out on the city of New York. It was claimed by the Islamic State group the perpetrator was reportedly an Uzbek national. In fact, this year alone, we've seen four attacks that we know of carried out by Uzbek nationals, showing that the Islamic State group are now recruiting Muslims in Central Asia. And beyond that, they're carrying out attacks across the globe. We saw them in 2016 alone on Egypt, Turkey, Indonesia, France, Belgium, the UK. The list goes on. So, A, uh, we know that they're still present and they don't even need weapons anymore. They are using very domestic weapons such as vehicles. B, we know that this threat is very much palpable and ongoing and it's still too early to celebrate their defeat. Thank you so much, uh, Sanam Shanti, for that analysis. Lodging an appeal. Paris prosecutors want to go back to court. They disagree with Thursday's decision to convict Mohamed Mera's brother for terrorism ties, but not for complicity. Abdelkader Mera was sentenced to 20 years behind bars over Mohamed's killing of seven people in 2012. But victims' families are outraged. He was not found guilty of helping him carry out his brother's crimes. Anka Ula has the story. A verdict has been rendered but not necessarily the one victim's families were hoping for. Abdelkader Mera faces 20 years in prison for having ties to a terrorist enterprise. But he was found not guilty of complicity in his brother's attacks, a more serious charge for which he would have faced life in prison. The prosecutor is now appealing the verdict, a welcome decision for the victim's families. When I heard this, I said to myself, there's still hope, I can't lose hope. It's important for our children, for all the victims. My children, my son and my two grandchildren, they have their life sentences. So Abdel Kader Mera should have his too. On Friday morning, Abdel Kader Mera's lawyers said that they were ready and willing to defend him again. Can a man that is seen as a very incarnation of evil be sentenced despite doubt? It's the only question worth asking. And of course, if there's a second trial, we'll ask the same question. The accused's older brother is convinced that Abdelkader Mera is still dangerous and hopes other witnesses will come forward. I hope, thanks to this second trial, that other people, especially in Toulouse, will break their silence, that they will no longer be afraid of Abdelkader Mera or other terrorists. Sentenced to 14 years in prison for ties to a terrorist association, the co-defendant, Feta Malki, also plans to appeal the verdict. It'll be the longest trip by a U.S. president to Asia in over 25 years. Donald Trump will be traveling first to Japan, then on to four other countries. At the top of his agenda, North Korea's nuclear missile program. But he'll also be talking trade, defense, and regional cooperation. Trump has decided to extend his trip to attend an East Asia summit in the Philippines. So we're about to begin a long trip. I know some of you are coming with us. We look forward to it. We're actually staying an extra day in the Philippines. We have a big conference, a second conference. And I think we're going to have great success. We'll be talking about trade. We'll be talking about, obviously, North Korea. We'll be enlisting the help of a lot of people and countries. We'll see what happens. But I think we're going to have a very successful trip. There's a lot of goodwill. Back in court, South African state prosecutors asked judges to hand down a harsher sentence to Oscar Pistorius. The Paralympian was found guilty of killing Riva Steenkamp, his girlfriend, back in 2016. Pistorius pleaded his innocence but was given a six-year jail sentence. Still, for state prosecutors, it's not enough. They say the track star lacks genuine remorse. Aaron Ogonkie has the story. Six years in prison for murdering his girlfriend, a sentence prosecutors are now hoping to change. The Oscar Pistorius case returned to the courtroom on Friday. Prosecutors will ask a South African appeals court to give the former Paralympics athlete a longer sentence. Murder carries a minimum sentence of 15 years. The court uh, effectively gave him six years. 
as much as the court has got a discretion to deviate from the minimum prescribed sentence when there are compelling circumstances, but in this case we're saying the court was too lenient. Despite the 15-year minimum for murder in South Africa, Pistorius was sentenced to six years due to mitigating factors, including the judge's assertion that he showed genuine remorse. Steenkamp's family has backed the appeal. On behalf of the family, they want to say that they believe in the justice system and they support the state and the law must run its course. And what's happening this morning is part of the process, the legal process. What Pistorius, who is serving his sentence in a prison near Pretoria, was unable to attend the hearing. He was originally convicted for culpable homicide, but in 2015, the appeals court upgraded the conviction to murder. Oscar Pistorius shot his girlfriend four times through a closed door in 2013. He claimed he thought she was a burglar. He's lost everything. He was an icon. That's the end of this edition. Do stay tuned. There's more news coming up on France 24. Do stay with us. You are here, your program spotlighting French heritage. Versailles, the Louvre, and the Mont Saint-Michel are all well-known stars of French heritage. But French genius and France harbors many other hidden treasures. The arts, gastronomy, architecture, as well as nature's wonders. Come along with France 24 and discover France's living heritage. From young apprentices to accomplished craftsmen, farmers, to Michelin star sporting chefs. Meet these people whose passion for their professions preserve and drive French heritage. You are here on France 24 and France24.com. Hello, I'm Rochelle Harrison Pless, and this is Encore coming up. We meet music maestro Daniel Barenboim, whose passion project, the West Eastern Divan Orchestra, continues to unite Israelis and Palestinians through melody. The Louvre Museum in Paris launches a multi million euro campaign to score a rare Renaissance masterpiece, the prayer book of French King Francois I. How long have you been in the FBI? 30 years. That's a lot of information. Democratic National Committee. And he's the whistleblower who brought down the White House. A new film has Liam Neeson starring as Mark Felt, the FBI agent who helped uncover the Watergate scandal of 1974. Put the investigation to bed. Thanks for joining us. United through music, the West Eastern Divan Orchestra gathers Israeli, Palestinian and other Arab musicians from across the Middle East, promoting peace, understanding and intercultural dialogue. At the helm is the renowned Argentinian Israeli pianist and conductor Daniel Barenboim. We sat down with the maestro during his recent trip to Paris. With a quick gesture, Daniel Barenboim corrects his musicians' mistakes. For the members of the East-West Divan Orchestra, working with him is the opportunity of a lifetime. He's wonderful. We learn so much from him. He's very demanding, and he always demands the highest possible out of the orchestra. His discipline and his ambitious to what he does is so, so much passion. So it's just it's a, a joy. It's a joy for me. Discipline to achieve perfection. A quality Baron Boehm learned from a young age with his father, a piano teacher. A prodigy, he gave his first concert at only seven years old in Buenos Aires, where he spent his childhood. After Argentina, Europe. Baron Boehm learned from the very best. Le premier que je rencontré, uh, the first pianist that I met when I was very young, who influenced me a lot and was very generous with me, was Arthur Rubinstein. Afterwards in Paris, when I was a student, I studied with Nadia Boulanger. And when I was 11, I met Wilhelm Furtwängler in Salzburg. He blew me away. In 1975, he's named music director and conductor of the Paris Orchestra. 
I have wonderfully fond, joyful memories of my years with the Paris Orchestra. I had so much fun with them. You always have more fun with Latin people. Paris, Chicago, Berlin. Barenboim's career is truly international. Of Israeli citizenship, in 1991 he founds the East Western Divan Orchestra, hoping to promote dialogue in the Middle East. We can't play in Israel, nor in Arab countries. In Israel it's because politics are against this. And in Arab countries it's because they boycott anything that comes from Israel, no matter what people think. In 2008, he symbolically acquired Palestinian citizenship. Today, Daniel Berenboim spends most of his time teaching, now that it's his turn to pass on knowledge. It's a Renaissance masterpiece, a treasure from the French House of Valois. The Book of Hours, the prayer book of French King François I, is owned by collectors in Britain. But France wants it back. The rare volume is on temporary display at the Louvre in Paris, and the museum has launched a 10 million euro crowdfunding campaign to make it part of its permanent collection. Rebecca Rossman has more. It's the fitting definition of a rare gem. Bound in gold and encrusted with ruby and turquoise jewels, the prayer book of French King Francois I, known as the Book of Hours, is a Renaissance-era heirloom that stayed in mint condition for more than 500 years. The Book of Francois I is something of a miracle because the majority of the royal family's treasures from the Renaissance period were lost, but this piece has made it through the centuries. While the Book of Hours was bought by English collectors in the 18th century, its London owner has now put it up for sale. Currently on temporary display at the Louvre, it will be made permanent if the museum can raise 10 million euros by next February. Already halfway there, thanks to a generous grant from a big French company, the Louvre has launched a crowdfunding campaign to raise the rest. The action group Tusmissen, or all sponsors, which is overseeing part of the campaign, hopes to collect 1 million euros from the public. Previous successful campaigns have led to the museum's acquisition of works including The Three Graces, Love by sculptor Jacques Sally, and Teshen's Table. Tusmissens has also contributed to the restoration of one of the Louvre's most iconic pieces, Winged Victory of Samothrace. Even if we give just a little bit, a part of these pieces then belong to us. Already a quarter of the way there, the group has until February 15, 2018, to reach its 1 million euro target. Paris's museums are a must-see for any visitor to the French capital, and right now, a packed cultural calendar is luring massive crowds. From the popular Christian Dior exhibition to the Gauguin display at the Grand Palais and MoMA in Paris, the City of Light is pulling out all the stops. Alexander Orcott has more. It's early in the morning, but already the crowds are out in force. The Louis Vuitton Foundation is showing famous pieces from New York's Museum of Modern Art. We get to see 200 iconic artworks that have crossed the Atlantic, so we all want to see them. New York's museum has come to France, and that doesn't happen every day. Magnificent artworks like this Cézanne or this unusual Edward Hopper, painted in 1925, are all on show. Only the best-known paintings have been brought over, and that's pulling in some 5,000 people per day. And there are similar crowds at the Grand Palais for the Gorgan exhibition. Here also, record numbers of people have been turning up for many weeks. So what's causing it? As the show is only on for a limited time, three months or so, clearly there is a bit of pressure with people asking each other if they've seen it or be careful because you could miss out. There's this kind of buzz around the event when it begins and then it spreads through word of mouth and it becomes a must-see, something fashionable. The queues outside the French capital's exhibitions speak for themselves. This one is for Christian Dior's 70th anniversary show. And this one is for the Yves Saint Laurent Museum, which opened last month. People are coming out. 
There was a drop in numbers after the Paris attacks, but now museums are popular again. The Yves Saint Laurent Museum has been finding it difficult to manage the massive influx of visitors. We were up to 900 to 1,000 visitors per day, but we very recently decided to lower the numbers to make a more comfortable visit. Last year, France's museums welcomed some 65 million visitors, and that number is quickly rising. Mark Felt, the man who brought down the White House, is not the first film to tell the story of the FBI agent who helped uncover the Watergate scandal of 1974. In this latest outing, retelling this piece of juicy political history, Liam Neeson steps into the role of Felt, the whistleblower also known as Deep Throat. No, I'm, I'm not Deep Throat, and uh, the only thing I can say is that I wouldn't be ashamed to be. This is Mark Felt. In 1972, he was the number two man in the FBI. But his alter ego had remained a mystery for some 30 years until he finally decided to tell his story in 2003. He is Deep Throat, the mole who helped two Washington Post journalists, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, to lift the lid on one of the biggest political scandals in history, Watergate. It was named after the building complex where the Democratic Party headquarters was based. A foiled break-in there set off an FBI investigation that found that Republican President Richard Nixon was involved in illegal espionage and eventually led to his downfall. There are no more interviews with White House people without permission. What? We put the investigation to bed in two days. The director Despite the pressure from the White House and the, the Secret FBI Service, Mark Felt continued his investigation to shine a light on what was happening in the shadows of government. The White House has no authority over the FBI. We can at all. The relevance in today's world in the Trump administration is remarkable. Uh, but for the FBI to leak this information goes against their entire code. So Felt knew that he betrayed the FBI to save the FBI. Gentlemen, the Felt was prepared to do anything to get the truth out in the open, no matter what the consequences. Portraying him, Liam Neeson says he was a difficult character to understand. Is the president lying? They're all lying. This is an FBI yes. man born and bred. 30 years he had spent there. And there was something charming about the man, but charming just up to a point. There was just something you couldn't quite read behind his eyes. Here's what we know. It's a race against time between Mark Felt and the Oval Office that brings together political commentary and suspense. There's a nickname for you at the paper. Deep Throat. And finally, nearly one year ago, billionaire tycoon Donald Trump caused the biggest political upset in modern U.S. history. A new documentary called 11 8 revisits Election Day last year when Trump scored a surprise victory.